And my name is Jenna Streit. I serve as the Advancement Director at the Milk Bank, and I'm so glad that you're here today for How Our Babies Made Us Human. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to share a little bit about the Milk Bank before we jump in. If you are not familiar with the Milk Bank, I'm so glad that you're here because hopefully you'll walk away knowing a little bit more. We serve fragile and premature infants um, across the country by providing pasteurized donor milk. And we only do this because we have the generous donations from milk donors across the country. And we're just so incredibly grateful for um, the wonderful community of individuals who provide donor milk and make it possible to save infant lives. Before we jump in, I just want to let you know that you are all muted. Um, you actually, your cameras are not on, um, but we do highly encourage you to share your questions along the way. We'll be checking in um, later in the presentation with Dr. Viley and um, getting your questions answered. So please submit them as you think of them. And um, I do want to introduce you to Dr. Amanda Viley. She's an assistant professor of biological anthropology at Purdue University. She also serves as the faculty associate with the Center on Aging and Life Course. Um, she serves as an executive board member for Ingestive Behavior Research Center. And finally, as the director of the Laboratory for Behavior Autogeny and Reproduction. Love the acronym there. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Viley. Thank you so much. We're so glad you're here. I'm gonna ask you to unmute Dr. Viley before you get started. There you go. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my lamprey? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, I want to start by thanking you for coming um, and for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here. I'm a middle-aged white woman wearing a purple turtleneck. I'm sitting in my office at Purdue University, but the background is blurred. And Purdue University occupies the traditional homelands of the Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Miami and Peoria people. I'll also tell you ahead of time that throughout this talk, you're going to see some ethnographic photos. All were taken with consent from the subjects and all of the subjects consented to have their images shared for educational purposes. All right, I'm here to share with you today a little bit about anthropology and evolution as they pertain to our babies. So I'm starting my talk with this phylogeny or family tree to show you that we humans share a common ancestor with all the living primates and that common ancestor dates back to 65 million years ago. We also share a common ancestor with all of the other apes about 25 million years ago, and last but not least, with our chimpanzee and bonobo cousins around six million years ago. But we're part of this big tree that consists of all these primates, and we share common ancestry, but we're different. We share a very recent common ancestor with the great apes, but we're different. How are we different and why are we different? In the last six million years, since our divergence with the chimpanzees and bonobos, we have evolved several evolutionarily novel and important distinguishing characteristics. Perhaps three of the most significant novel traits that make us human are our large, complex, and energetically costly brains, our ability and tendency to walk on our hind legs, and the fact that we have really high fertility, 
lots of babies for a large-bodied mammalian species. Because we have so many babies, there are a lot of us. In fact, there are nearly 8 billion humans, which is arguably an environmental catastrophe, but is a testament to our reproductive success as a species. Meanwhile, quite tragically, our close great ape cousins number just about half a million in the wild and are at very high risk of extinction. But why are we so different? And why do we have so many babies? We can answer these questions by studying human evolutionary history. An evolutionary perspective into human uniqueness involves comparing us with our closest living primate relatives, an examination of the human fossil record, and studying the lives of contemporary humans who live in non-industrialized societies like foragers, hunter-gatherers, and small-scale farmers. We'll find that our unique human traits are inextricably linked to our babies and our evolved systems of birthing, feeding, and caring for them. So you may be wondering what do babies really have to do with evolution? Within evolutionary theory, natural selection is the process that creates adaptations that maximize survival and reproduction or reproductive success. Babies are a direct measure of reproductive success and therefore can be thought of as the currency of natural selection. Human babies possess some characteristics that are unique among mammals and even among other apes. Our births are hard, our babies are needy, and our babies are fat compared to the other great apes. My talk today will cover three topics. First, the evolution of the human birth mechanism or why it hurts so bad and takes so long. Second, human specific infant feeding behaviors or why our babies are so fat and why breastfeeding is hard. And third, how babies help shape early human social organization, or why our babies are so needy for so long. I'm going to begin by describing some important dimensions of the human birth mechanism, but first, let's consider the birth of this gelata monkey. She went into labor in the presence of Jeff Kirby, a wildlife photographer. He knew something was up when the mama left the group, so he followed her, and shortly after, this little baby face appeared. This was very rare to observe or catch on film. Gelata mothers, like most non-human primates, prefer to have solitary births. What followed were described as 20 agonizing minutes of contractions and muscle spasms and rapid changes in position. And here we can see that mama is pushing really hard. And after 20 minutes, she's looking pretty happy and she's holding her baby. We can take away from this two important points. One is that gelata labors are fast. And the second is that gelata's birth alone. And this conforms to a general non-human primate birthing pattern, including that of the apes, except for humans. What about humans? In contrast, human labors are long and human birth is social. In one recent study, 
multi-paris birthers, so these are birthers who had given birth before, had a median active labor duration of 3.3 hours, whereas nulliparis or first-time birthers had a median labor duration of 7.5 hours. The multiparous labors lasted at most up to 12 hours, whereas the nulliparous labors lasted at most up to 35 hours, both quite a bit longer than that gelata monkey's 20 minute birth. Importantly, these findings come from a large data set of spontaneous vaginal births with minimal medical interventions and no interventions designed to hasten the labor process. For humans, birth is also a social activity. Unlike non-human primates, human mothers actively seek assistance in childbirth. Virtually all women in all societies seek assistance at delivery from relatives, midwives, or obstetricians. In a survey of 296 cultural groups for which attendance at childbirth was available, 268 or 92 percent practiced some form of assisted birth. The remaining 8 percent non-assisted birth was documented but nearly always under specific and often exceptional circumstances. In this ancient Greek relief on the right, a woman is shown squatting on a birth stool with arms around helpers on each side while the midwife catches the baby below. And here are some artistic renderings of assisted human birth in historical and contemporary context. From early 19th century France in the upper right, 19th century United States in the lower left, a drawing by Drew Starr. In historical and contemporary Yucatan, Mexico in the upper right, a drawing by Michelle Jones. And of course, there's been an increasing tendency toward medicalized births and rising cesarean delivery rates in most parts of the world in the 20th and 21st centuries, which is depicted artistically in the lower right image. But why is human birth so long and why is assistance needed? Why don't we have fast and solitary births like Natasha, this chimpanzee at Nagamba Island Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Uganda? Evolutionary anthropologists have long attributed these phenomenon to conflicting biomechanical pressures of being a biped, walking on two legs, who births big brain babies in what is known as the obstetric dilemma hypothesis. Here, we have an image comparing a chimpanzee pelvis on the left to a human pelvis on the right. And you can see that the pelvis of the quadrupedal chimpanzee is long and narrow. And the inlet, which is where the baby will drop into the pelvis at birth, is oriented in the same direction as the outlet where the baby goes out. This essentially creates a chute for a newborn to pass through. Throughout the evolution of bipedal locomotion over the past six million years, the human pelvis, in contrast, has become shorter, stouter, and bowl-shaped. This shape stabilizes bipedal locomotion, and the flaring ilium, or hip bones, provide extra space for muscle attachment of the abductors, which run down the outside of our thighs and help us stay upright. Chimpanzees don't have these. So while they can walk bipedally for short distances, they're not very good at it. An additional consequence of bipedal locomotion and changes in pelvic shape are that the human pelvic inlet, we're looking down at the pelvis from the top, 
and the human pelvic outlet do not line up, looking from the bottom. So the infant head has to pass through the inlet, then twist the head and the shoulders to reorient in order to exit through the outlet in what is known as rotational birth. This means that in non-breach situations, the baby is born facing away from the mother, which is why most human birthing systems designate someone other than the mother to catch the baby. Humans also have relatively large-brained and large-bodied infants. This image comes from a 2012 paper by Holly Dunsworth and colleagues and compares gestation length, newborn brain size, and newborn body size across the great apes. From the top to bottom, we have Pongo, which are the orangutans, gorilla, which are the gorillas, pan, which are the chimpanzees, and of course, homo sapiens or humans. This plot is showing us standard residuals or z-scores which is where each species average lies on a regression line for primates while controlling for maternal body size. This will make more sense in a second. This line shows the mean for primates, 0, 0.0. So a positive number means the trait is longer or bigger than you would expect for a primate that body size, and a negative number means the trait is shorter or smaller than you would expect for a primate that body size. For now, I just want you to pay attention to these two measures. Those positive numbers mean that homo or humans have bigger brained, bigger bodied newborns than one would expect for a primate of comparable body size. Specifically, they're about one and 1.3 z-scores bigger and they definitely diverge from the other apes in these newborn characteristics. So the combination of a broad, broad stout pelvis and a large-brained newborn means that humans birth larger-brained babies relative to the size of the pelvic outlet compared to our great ape cousins. We're not the only mammal to have such a tight fit, but we are the only ape. And this is to some extent driven by our evolutionary legacy of bipedalism. This is the obstetric dilemma hypothesis and an argument for why humans evolved assisted birth. Now there have been a number of challenges to the obstetric dilemma hypothesis in recent years, mostly arguing that modern environments may exacerbate childbirth difficulties and that birth is more constrained by maternal metabolism than it is by pelvic shape and size. These are fantastic papers and compelling arguments that are not always mutually exclusive with the obstetric dilemma. It does seem from the archeological record that obstetric death rates were fairly high for women in ancient foraging societies. In the study of South African foragers from roughly 10,000 to 300 years ago, the risk of death from age 18 to 24 years, the early reproductive period, was twice as high for women as it was for men. And while it's challenging to assign cause of death in archeological samples, the authors fail to identify any other potential risk to life apart from childbirth that would be specific to young adult females in this population. Furthermore, while maternal death rates vary, across contemporary foraging societies, women like these Venezuelan Pume Savannah foragers do report high childbirth complication rates, suggesting that we humans, with our broad twisty pelvis and our big brain babies, 
experience extra challenges with childbirth that can be alleviated with the help of others. And this led Karen Rosenberg and myself to conclude that humans are a cooperative species. Human cooperation extends to the context of childbirth with better outcomes consistently observed in women who receive both physical assistance and emotional support. We're going to learn in this next part of my talk that human cooperation also extends to infant feeding behaviors. Humans, of course, are mammals, meaning we feed our babies with milk produced in our mammary glands. And lactation evolved around 300 million years ago in the pre-mammal egg-laying therospids. In contemporary mammals, this ancient adaptation promotes health and survival in infancy, which is a challenging time because mammalian babies are born immunologically naive. Mammalian milk is a largely sterile food which buffers infants, both nutritionally and immunologically, as their immune function is mature. Though other forms of infant feeding are practiced in some contemporary human societies, breast milk, when available, is the best food for infants and prolonged intensive breastfeeding would have been absolutely necessary for infant survival in our hunting and gathering ancestors. Humans, like other great apes, are long-lived mammals who invest in a relatively small number of offspring for a large, long period of time. We've already seen that most apes invest in relatively long gestation lengths compared to other primates. This prolonged investment extends to lactation, which ranges from two to eight years in the apes, with the longest duration seen in the orangutan. Still, human babies do differ from other apes in a few interesting ways. For example, human babies are fat. Just compare this adorable scrawny baby gorilla to this adorable chubby baby human. These species level differences in fat deposition patterning begin while the babies are in utero. Here you can see that human newborns have about 15% body fat at birth. And while there are no other apes on this chart, the only other primate, the baboon, a monkey, has a newborn with about 3% body fat. This falls in line with the body fat percentage of our baby gorilla. The closest runners up to humans are the guinea pig and the harp seal, each with about 10% body fat at birth. You may be wondering what a human, a guinea pig, and a harp seal share in common. It turns out that prenatal fat deposition seems to be an evolved mammalian strategy to prepare for nutritional disruptions in the early postnatal period. Now, of course, all placental mammals experience the abrupt cessation of placental nutrition when they're born. The placenta is usually quickly replaced by the teat and its milk as a source of maternally derived nutrition and immune support in mammals. However, harp seal babies only consume mother's milk for a week. Then they are weaned and they have to fast for a month or more. So they lay down copious amounts of fat prenatally and in the first postnatal week of life while consuming their mother's nutrient-dense milk. And these fatty layers buffer them from malnutrition throughout the period of fasting. 
guinea pig babies are also born with 10% body fat, which seems to support them post-birth when they become undernourished for several weird reasons. First, the energy content of guinea pig breast milks is really low. Second, mothers only have two teeth, but may care for up to five pups at a time. And third, guinea pig pups begin to consume solid food almost immediately after they're born, which exposes them to environmental microbes that may be the source of infection. So they need to have extra fat to offset the risk of infection-induced weight loss in the early postnatal period. But what about humans? Why would human infants experience a postnatal nutritional disruption? Numerous reports of wild and captive monkeys and apes suggest that lactation is not purely innate, but requires some learning. For example, first-time primate mothers and those who had limited opportunities for social learning seem to struggle the most with establishing lactation. But even in the absence of these factors, it often takes time for a mother-infant dyad to get the hang of nursing. This very recent paper by Batiscu et al. summarizes lactation complications in wild chimpanzees nicely. Chimpanzee infants take time to nurse efficiently. Newborns may need longer and more frequent nipple contacts than older infants to obtain enough milk. Indeed, newborns often took time to latch and sometimes had difficulty remaining latched. Mothers may also have needed time to adjust as newborns usually required extensive physical support to stay higher on the chest, which aided in latching. Establishing lactation may be even harder for the human newborn. According to evolutionary psychologist Anthony Volk, human breastfeeding challenges are exacerbated for three non-mutually exclusive reasons. First, humans are uniquely altricial or underdeveloped at birth. Second, human women have uniquely large breasts. And third, humans have unique big brains and extensive capacity for social learning. Human babies, despite their high percentage of body fat, are born skeletally and neurologically altricial or highly dependent. Because their brain is only 27% developed at birth, this is fairly underdeveloped compared to a chimpanzee baby whose brain is 36 to 40% developed at birth, and a macaque monkey whose brain is 70% developed at birth. So our babies are born unable to lift their heads and spend on average at least a year in a nearly incapacitated state, whereas chimpanzee babies begin to walk independently between four and six months. Therefore, altricial human infants depend on their parents much more than other primates. Human altriciality is likely to contribute to latching and other breastfeeding problems that are even more pronounced than they are in other primates. And this may be further exacerbated by the fact that humans have exceptionally large breasts, especially when they engorge as the milk comes in. While any evolved function of large and permanent human breasts remain debated, we can see that this much less fleshy chimpanzee breast provides a much easier target for a newborn to suckle. Bulk's final suggestion regarding human postnatal breastfeeding challenges is that 
as a slow growing, large brained social mammal, we are exceptionally dependent on social learning and breastfeeding is no exception. Indeed, if you visit these Venezuelan Pume savanna foragers or these Chimani forager farmers in the Bolivian Amazon or these small scale subsistence farmers, the Yucatec Maya, you'll find that in all of these societies, prolonged and intensive breastfeeding are the norm and are encouraged. There are no public breastfeeding taboos. Breastfeeding initiation is universal with overall durations frequently exceeding the World Health Organization recommendation of two years. In contrast, for many parents in industrialized and westernized societies, there is little support for breastfeeding and few opportunities for social learning. But parents often have to turn to specialized consultants or the internet when problems arise. For mothers in the United States, Canada, and New Zealand, breastfeeding problems are a major predictor of early weaning. In the non-industrialized societies, we see a very different learning pattern. I've studied breastfeeding in the Pume, Chimani, and the Maya, but especially the Maya. And my work has shown that Maya women do experience breastfeeding problems, but they rely on social support and long-standing cultural practices to alleviate them. Maya women in the community where I've worked most breastfeed for a median of 30 months. And accordingly, Bulk concludes in his 2009 paper that regardless of the fundamental source of human breastfeeding difficulties, our ancestors found a stable and effective solution by reliably living in large groups that promoted alloparental care of breastfeeding mothers through direct informational and socio-emotional support. Alloparental care refers to direct and indirect infant and child care that comes from sources other than the biological parents and turns out to be another important ancient human strategy to maximize the survival of our hard to birth fat and needy babies. So we've now seen that the three species that give birth to the fattest newborns share the need to mobilize and use fat as a buffer against undernutrition after birth. In humans, this is largely thanks to our needy babies and large breasts and brains. This is likely to account for our evolved strategy of prenatal fat deposition. But what happens to our fat newborns next? What happens once lactation is established? Remember, the harp seal deposits a new layer of fat during one week of lactation prior to a one month fast. Human babies in 113 non-industrialized societies for which data are available, are going to be express fed exclusively for four to five months and weaned around 29 months of age. In a feeding pattern that probably resembles the human norm for most of the evolutionary history of our species. And this feeding pattern seems to work because our fat newborns just keep getting fatter under nutritionally adequate conditions, human infants experience a rapid accumulation of fat beginning shortly post-birth and continuing to about nine months of age in a pattern that is atypical among mammals. This fat deposition accounts for roughly half of an infant's weight gain and half of their energy expenditure in the first four to six months of life. 
adiposity peaks at around 25% of body mass from roughly six to nine months in well-nourished populations. This fat serves as an energy buffer beyond the postnatal phase, perhaps in anticipation of the introduction of non-breast milk foods. Across mammalian species, lactation patterns will to some extent conform to this generalized model. Here we have child age on the x-axis and daily caloric intake on the y-axis. And we start with a period of exclusive suckling of milk in which infants grow and maternal milk production increases. Until infant energetic requirements start to exceed what is available in maternal breast milk. So there's usually a brief transitional period in which infants are still suckling, but also consuming non-breast milk foods. Long-lived species like baboons and chimpanzees also have a fairly long transitional feeding stage. But in humans, there are some components of transitional feeding that distinguish us from other species. And as you may have guessed, an important dimension is going to be who feeds the babies. Like birth and the early establishment of lactation, transitional feeding is a cooperative endeavor in humans in non-industrialized societies. Unlike a chimpanzee mother, who has to feed the baby all on her own, human mothers receive help. Human weanlings receive foods provisioned by mothers, other kin, and unrelated alloparents. Like this Bolivian Chimani infant on the left and this Yucatec Maya infant on the right, both of whom are surrounded by potential alloparent feeders. Second, human infant foods are specially prepared. Processing may involve mastication, peeling, boiling, mashing, pounding, with two general goals. First, make the food digestible for young maturing digestive systems. And second, provide foods that are hygienic. But there is always a risk of contamination from non-breast milk foods during the transitional feeding stage. But remember, our babies have already deposited a whole lot of fat in the first months of life, which provides a buffer for any energetically costly immune response and can help minimize weight loss in the face of infection. In a final way in which human transitional feeding is unique, the transitional feeding stage in humans does not culminate in nutritional independence. The transitional feeding stage for all mammals will end with the cessation of lactation. In many mammals, this indicates the shift to independent foraging and true nutritional independence. For example, chimpanzees become successful independent foragers between four and six years of age. However, some species, including humans, have a period of post-weaning provisioning in which parents and other group members continue to provide and prepare foods for the weanling. Now remember, a recently weaned human is going to be between two and three years of age, so still very dependent and certainly incapable of effective independent foraging. This task is nearly always allocated to alloparents because in a high fertility, non-hormonally contracepting society, a mother with a two to three-year-old might already be pregnant or even have a new baby at this point. The provision feeding period in humans usually lasts from about two to three 
to about six years when children are fully weaned during this period, but they're still highly dependent. In this stage of childhood, fat reserves quickly diminish, but the adult immune system is now largely intact and the infants, the weanlings, are less in need of an energy buffer in times of risk of illness or death from infectious disease. But in reality, while they're certainly learning to forage, human children cannot begin to forage at six years of age. As we know, our babies remain dependent on family resources for a long time. Our offspring are needy. And this is not just the case in very contemporary societies. In fact, a quantitative comparison across nine hunter-gatherer societies showed that men do not reach their pink hunting ability until they are 35. And women encumbered with childcare do not reach their peak foraging production until they are postmenopausal. In small scale farmers like the Yucatec Maya, farming production ability reaches adult levels in men and women by the late teens. And of course, independence is further delayed if we send our children to school instead of teaching them to forage and farm. All of this has important implications for the evolution of human social organization. Cooperative birthing and child feeding practices are adaptations to unique human evolutionary constraints associated with our bipedalism, our fat needy babies, our large breasts, and our large brains. While bipedalism is more ancient, most of these traits and behaviors appear in the human fossil record in the last two million years with the emergence of our African ancestor, Homo ergaster, sometimes called Homo erectus. And these traits are fully in place when our species, Homo sapiens, appears on the fossil record by about 200,000 years ago. Extensive cooperation seems to underlie our biological success as a species. It is not limited to birth and infant feeding. It extends to several other areas of human life, such as extensive intergenerational food sharing and broader forms of alloparental care. This cooperation seems to help maximize survival of human infants, even while shortening the infant period. Indeed, amongst apes, humans have a relatively short lactation duration and relatively short intervals between births. This plot shows mean species level interbirth intervals in monkeys and apes. Maternal weight is on the x-axis. Interbirth interval is on the y-axis. The black box indicates the mean for the species, and the lines are error bars, indicating the amount of variation around the mean. These are the monkeys with a mean interbirth interval of about 20 months, so they have their babies roughly 20 months apart. These are the apes, which show a lot of within species variation based on those big error bars, but falling somewhere near a 50 month mean interval between births. And here we see interbirth intervals of two contemporary hunting and gathering human societies from Namibia and Australia falling in at the lower end of the ape spectrum, just over 20 and just under 40 months. Shortened interbirth intervals means that humans can accelerate the reproductive rate. 
through food sharing and alloparental support, human fertility can be increased by subsidizing reproductive aged women with food and by helping care for their weanlings. All of this means that moms can have another baby sooner. This plot shows life history schedules and basic demographic parameters like interbirth interval and total fertility rate in orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and human foragers. And the forager sample is an average from four well-studied populations, Biache of Paraguay, the Kong of Botswana, the Hiwi of Venezuela, and the Hadza of Tanzania. I want you to first pay attention to the duration of infancy, which is going to be that box all the way over on the left. Infant duration is notably shorter in the human foragers compared to the other great apes. Furthermore, the period of post-weaning human provisioning that I previous, previously described, two to six years of age, is here called childhood and only exists in the humans. The apes transition straight from infancy to juvenility or independent foraging. We also see here that human reproduction begins comparatively late relative to the other great apes in the late teens. But all that early life nutritional and alloparental support means that humans have a longer reproductive window. The black horizontal arrows show life expectancy of individuals who survive to reproductive age. This is going to be 25 and 30 in the orangutan and the chimpanzee respectively, and nearly 55 in the humans. So just take a look at that potential duration in which humans can be reproducing. And then we see that while humans are still reproducing, the other great apes are going to be not alive anymore. They die at much younger ages. This means that despite starting late, humans have longer reproductive lifespans as I just showed. And because of our short infancies, we have more closely spaced births. What this means is that human foragers have, on average, six children across the life course, which is a lot for a large-bodied mammal. The chimpanzee only has two, the gorilla only has three, and the orangutan, whoops, sorry about that, the orangutan shows no data, but their fertility is often going to be lower than one. This human tendency towards shorter human infancy has been evolving for th three million years, beginning with Australopithecus, arguably a human ancestor, who shows a long infant period and no childhood like the apes. We don't see the insertion of the childhood phase until the appearance of the genus Homo. And we're going to see a gradual lengthening of the post-weaning periods of offspring dependency, childhood, juvenility, adolescence, over the last three million years, with really prolonged offspring dependency in Homo sapiens. Certainly, our cooperation facilitates higher survivorships, shorter infancy, higher fertility, which likely helped our human ancestors outcompete the Neanderthals, and surely accounts for the astounding population growth rate that continues today. Our human uniqueness 
and reproductive success is inextricably linked to the unusual evolutionary trajectory of our babies and our evolved systems of birthing, feeding, and caring for them. I am finished. Um, this is my needy, no longer altricial offspring sitting with great apes and monkeys as part of a phylogeny. Um, I'm happy to take questions at this point, and I'll thank you again for attending. Dr. Viley, wow, I I was off camera and I'm glad I was on mute because there were so many times where I just was shocked. There was some really interesting information you shared. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one question submitted and um, so I welcome anyone else to submit them if they've got any um, on their mind and then I have a question as well. Um, so the question we have submitted is, is it true that the position women are in when giving birth um, typically and now on their backs is inefficient and plays a role in how painful birthing is? Um, the short answer is yes, probably. Um, it is true that in most cultures, in non-medicalized settings, birth is in some kind of vertical form, whether it's squatting or in a hammock or using some kind of chair or using some kind of a rope. Um, however, and I know if my grad student's here, she's going to get mad at me. I have not actually seen data showing that upright births do actually improve birth outcomes. So it does seem like lying flat on your back is probably not optimal for opening up your pelvis. However, a main reason that it's practiced in the United States and many other parts of the world is because most women by then have had a lot of drugs and can't walk safely. So um, it is a complex question and a very good one. And I hope that's a good answer. I think it was a good answer. Thank you. So uh, my question is, is about um, when you talked about support in the cultures that you've studied, I was thinking about our own and you mentioned this, that we have access to specialists. Um, it also made me think about how a lot of our support is commercialized, like special pillows and salves and shields and all sorts of things. Do you see versions of those in the communities that you've studied? They've arrived from the outside. Um, I wouldn't say that I see them within the communities. Um, there are certainly things that people do to alleviate breastfeeding complications, but the information is widely shared, not for any kind of you know, financial benefit, and the resources are widely shared. But all of these societies have had some exposure to varying extents to um, outside influences. And I would say of them, the Maya most have been um, exposed to things like um, infant foods like Gerber, um, powdered milk, um, and maybe told that it's okay to bottle feed your baby if you can't breastfeed, and this didn't used to be the case. So it's trickling in, but it wasn't there before. Um, that kind of leads me to a second question about um, milk sharing in the communities that you've studied. Um, the role of the milk bank certainly serves as a um, a way to share milk safely um, with families. So what does that look like in the communities you studied? So in the communities where I study, it happens, but it is not a widespread practice. So generally it happens, for example, if mother has to be away, if mother is sick, there's actually been cases where the mother's been hospitalized and someone else, her mother, her daughter, her sister is also lactating and will nurse the baby. Um, however, like I said, it's just a once in a while kind of thing. And um, people don't have particularly strong feelings about it. They don't think, oh, you should do this or, oh, you shouldn't do this. It just, mm -hmm. it makes sense to do it sometimes. Yeah. There is a society in the Central African Republic called the FA 
that are very well known for really extensive alum nursing. And I'm happy to send you papers on this. Um, so they pretty much from the day the baby's born, they start passing the baby around and all the lactating women nurse them. So that's an interesting case, but I wouldn't say it's the norm. Interesting. Uh, we have one more question submitted. It's kind of a big one, but um, what predictions do you have for future humans? Um, I think we're gonna keep having lots of babies. <laughs> um, <laughs> And hopefully, you know, with our technology, we can come up with ways to manage this population growth and to make sure that resources are fairly distributed so that everyone can um, kind of reap the benefits of, of our big brains and our cooperative behaviors that have allowed us to become so technologically savvy and create such wonderful things. I think that was a great answer for a very big question. Yeah, I'm happy to discuss that one more outside of this. Well, I am so grateful that you've uh, spent some of your day with us. I think for so many um, in the birth and breastfeeding worlds, um, this is a, just a wonderful reset, a way to really connect with um, the very root of what we do and why we do it. And so I'm so grateful for your, your presentation today. Thank you.